Um, our first speaker is actually, there's been a change in the original program. So we're actually having Suzanne Poynton and Sarah Rahman's presentation today. Um, there is actually an insert in your conference handbook with their abstract. So their presentation is the effect of the New South Wales Custodial Violent Offender Treatment Program on reoffending. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Suzanne Poynton. Uh, I am presenting some work that we did towards the end of last year looking at the Violent Offender Treatment Program, which is a custodial-based program that's uh, delivered by Corrective Services New South Wales. We're looking at the impact of it on reoffending. Um, just want to acknowledge my other co-author, Sarah Rahman, who is presenting next door, uh, who did the bulk of the analysis for this research but also Wai Yin Wan, who contributed, made a major contribution to the design that we ended up adopting and had a lot of fun cleaning the data in terms of the program information. So just to give you a bit of background on violent reoffending, which you all probably know, our imprisonment rates have been steadily rising over the last three decades across Australia. New South Wales is no exception. Uh, there does seem to be somewhat of a small decline in the last two quarters, but we're still looking at about 13,000 inmates at any one time. Now, many of these inmates will be there for a serious violent offence. So over half of those who are in the sentence population and a half of those in the remand population are there with a violent offence as their most serious charge. Many of these will go on to commit further offences once they're released from prison. Uh, Claire Ringland and Don Weatherburn did some estimates uh, a few years back looking at violent offenders who were released to parole and they found about a third of them will go on to commit a new offence. About one in ten will return to custody for a breach of their parole without a new offence. What they found in this study though was interesting that uh, uh, they didn't tend to specialise in violent offending. They tended to commit all sorts of crimes once they were released from prison. And this is consistent with uh, evidence from the US as well, where we see that they commit all sorts of a variety of crimes. But there are some specific subgroups of violent offenders who seem to be at much greater risk. Uh, Claire and Don found it was, uh, at least amongst their sample, young Aboriginal males. And particularly the LSIR, which is a standardised risk assessment tool that's used uh, on a regular basis by corrective services in New South Wales and I'm sure a lot of other correctional centres across Australia, and it was those people who are at the medium and high risk level who are much more likely to be our persistent repeat offenders. So there is this new renewed interest in trying to work out what might work to try and reduce offending amongst this persistent uh, group. So we looked at the Violent Offender Treatment Pro Program. Now this is a program that's delivered in custody. It's been in its current form since about 2003. Uh, it's delivered by a multidisciplinary team in what's called a, a modified therapeutic community. This team includes psychologists, it includes correctional staff from the centre, as well as other staff from, uh, from their offender services. It's only in one correctional centre in New South Wales currently, uh, that's Park Lee. Uh, it's a relatively small unit of 64 beds at any uh, given time. It's only for male inmates. There isn't anything similar at this stage for the female inmates. Uh, and they do need to be serving a pretty uh, lengthy custodial uh, sentence, so at least two years non-parole period. It can be their current charge that's a violent offence, uh, or they can have a history of violence, including a history of domestic violence, uh, or they might have been violent in custody. But as I said, the, it is a priority that people who are assessed at the medium to high to high risk level uh, a, a given access to this program. It's a long, intensive program, about nine to 12 months in duration, uh, and it consists of three phases. So there's initial assessment phase, preparatory phase, where they start to look at issues to do with treatment readiness. Uh, then there is about a six-month treatment phase, and in this phase, the participants have to attend three two-hour uh, um, cognitive behavior behavioral therapy sessions in a group of up to other 11 other participants. Uh, and it's on a weekly basis that they're attending these sessions. There's also what's called the VOTP maintenance component to the program, and this is a post-program uh, support. It can be provided in custody if the people are released to the general population after completing the program, or uh, delivered in the community if they're discharged from prison. 
So what do we already know about approaches to, to reducing reoffending amongst uh, violent offenders? Well, in terms of at least general offending, there is good evidence that CBT-based therapeutic programs can work. Uh, if you go to Crime Solutions, which David was just talking about, they have a meta-analysis there rating the, whether a range of different programs are effective or promising, and CBT was in about three quarters of the cases uh, suggested to be effective or promising in terms of reducing offending amongst general offenders. But you'd be surprised to know that um, uh, the evidence in relation specifically to violent offending is quite limited. Uh, there's two uh, meta-analyses there that I've referred to. The first only found about seven evaluations that were robust enough to include in their meta-analysis. Uh, the second one there by Jolly from Farrington found only about 11. And whenever they looked at these studies, those that were more used mo more robust methods actually uh, were the ones that were found in smaller effect, found smaller effect sizes. So this led them to conclude that well-designed evaluations should be a very high priority. Criminal justice systems intend to continue to invest in programs for serious violent offenders. In terms of research around uh, the violent treatment offender program that we're looking at today, there has been some work commissioned by Corrective Services New South Wales in the past. Uh, they tended to look at changes in program participants measures on psychological uh, aspects such as changes in cognition, emotional regulation and empathy. Uh, and they did find that the treatment goals of VOTP were consistently being met. However, they haven't looked at this next stage of whether or not these are translating into changes in recidivism. So this is what we were trying to do in this study. And we were trying to look at what the causal impact of VOTP participation is on reoffending and also on returning to custody. There's a number of things that we had to consider and probably the first and foremost was that it's a voluntary program. People aren't manda mandated to uh, participate in the program, although strongly encouraged. Uh, so this means that we could have problems of omit a variable bias, which I'll talk briefly about um, next. So this means that there might be something that is different between those who participate in the program than those who don't decide not to participate in the program. And unless we're able to observe and control for that in our models, then we might be underestimating or overestimating the effect of the treatment. So the other thing we need to consider was that there is a limited capacity on the program. So the volume of offenders that we could include in the analysis was quite small. This was compounded by the fact that we had to wait for them to be discharged from prison. We had to wait for 24 months uh, to measure their reoffending. And also, many of them will commit a new non-violent offence, be returned to prison, or they may be breach their parole without any new offence. So they were all things that we needed to consider here. What we ended up doing was using two approaches, an instrumental variable approach to deal with this problem of emitted variable bias that I was talking about, as well as a um, ordinarily squares uh, methods because we don't have a large enough sample um, necessarily to find effects using the less efficient IV methods. We've also looked at free time to reoffending to deal with this problem around um, uh, censoring of offenders and then returning to custody before we can observe them for long enough. The data that we used uh, came from two primary sources. So Corrective Services New South Wales has an uh, offender information management system known as OIMS. This has all the program information. So this is where we got referrals, uh, names of people who referred to the program, whether or not they started the program, uh, their attendance at all the sessions and completions or reasons for not completing the program. We link this with the Bureau's reoffending database, uh, which has information on all court appearances that have been finalised in New South Wales since two, uh, 1994, and also has some more extra information from New South Wales Police and custodial data as well. In terms of the outcomes we are interested in, we're interested in both general reoffending, that is whether or not they came back for, or they, whether or not they had a proven offence of any type, as well as violent offending. Uh, but we also included this return to custody as one of our outcomes as well, so reoffending with any new offence as well as returning to custody. This is to sort of boost our sample size because, as I said, many were returning for breach of parole. We looked at 24 months free time. Free time, they had to be in the community for, all of the, for at least 24 months uh, for us to measure their outcomes, and we had a wide range of controls that we could include in our models, AHC for quartile, ARIA, 
We did have the level of service in inventory risk assessment that was done at the time of the referral, so we could include this in the model. Aboriginality, we knew whether they were being released to parole when they were discharged from prison, and we had a wide range of prior criminal offending uh, uh, measures as well from the reoffending database. Importantly, we knew how many prior prison episodes they had, how many prior proven court appearances, and their, time, their age at which they had the first contact with the criminal justice system. <coughs> So, as I said, the biggest problem for us was that it was a voluntary program, um, so we might expect to see uh, differences between those who, who start the program and those who don't. Mid of variable bias is when uh, we have a, a particular factor that meets three conditions. So, it influences reoffending behaviour, it's correlated with program participation, and we can't observe it, so we can't control for it in our model. And it's not really clear which way the bias would uh, head in terms of uh, the violent offender treatment program. So it is quite possible that the people who volunteer to participate in the program are just more motivated people to, more motivated to change their behaviour. And if we did a simple comparison between them and those who didn't start the program, any treatment effect we're seeing could just be due to this motivation to change rather than to a true causal impact of the program. So if we can't control and observe this intrinsic control for uh, this intrinsic motivation in our models, then we have a problem and we'll be uh, overestimating the effect of the program on reoffending. But it's also quite possible that we have a much higher risk group who are uh, participating in the program. And this may be because they have stronger incentive to take part in the program, particularly if they're looking to go toward, to a parole board and, and plead their case that they were, are safe enough to release to the community. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they are given priority uh, higher risk offenders. So we might expect to see uh, a more risky group among, uh, that are uh, actually participating in the program. Uh, if we can't capture this information, then we'll be underestimating any effect of the treatment. So a solution that economists use and which uh, Sarah used in this particular study was an instrumental variable approach. Uh, so in this approach, I'm not going to pre be presenting all the equations for you, but basically you find an instrument that's correlated with program participation, but not with uh, our outcome, which is reoffending in this instance. And this allows us to isolate variation in program participation that is unrelated to other unobserved factors. We can then exploit this random variation to, to estimate the causal effects. So uh, the instrument that we used in this analysis was the data VOTP referral. So if you look at this next slide, what we've got um, is the time remaining to release. So this is the date of referral to the uh, estimated time of release. And along here we have the proportion who completed, which is the dark orange, and the proportion who commenced. And you can see that those people had less than 12 months between the time they were referred and when they're expected to be released. Very, very few of them started the program. But if we look at the other end of the spectrum, we have five or more years from date of uh, referral to release, they're much more likely to start the program. Now, given that participants don't have much influence over when they're referred in their sentence, uh, it's unlikely that this is related to reoffending, but it's obviously strongly correlated with whether or not they start the program. So it is a good instrument. Sarah did a lot of, of other tests for the instrument to see whether it was valid and uh, strong enough to use in the analysis and I'll leave those for you to read in the report. But, um, so, we, so we did an IV uh, analysis, but we also, one limitation of this approach is that um, although it gives you more consistent estimates of causal effects of treatment programs, it does result in very large standard errors, so there is a cost of statistical power. Um, we have a very small sample size here, so we also did uh, run linear probability models, which I'll be presenting the results from as well uh, because of this issue. And we'll be talking about an endogeneity test that we did to see whether or not we have confidence in those OLS uh, estimates. But using these uh, two different methods, we looked at two comparisons, those who started the OTP with those who referred and never started the program. And we looked at uh, inmates who completed the OTP and compared them with those who didn't start or complete the program. 
Just a little bit of a description of the sample that we had here. There was 587 offenders that uh, were referred to VHEP during the period that we were looking at, so 7 to 14. Uh, and they also, 507 who had sufficient follow-up period as well for us to include in the analysis. 45% of those who were referred started the program. And a very high proportion of those who started the program completed the program, which is encouraging and uh, a little bit surprising given that it is a very long intensive program. So about 80% of those who started completed. Around half of the, all of those referrals that I'm talking about were uh, uh, Aboriginal defendants, uh, Aboriginal inmates, and over three quarters were aged less than 40. They were a very high risk group, 70% uh, were a medium or higher on the LSIR, 60% were from the two lowest uh, CIFA, CIFA quartiles, 70% had their first contact with the criminal justice system at age, of an age under 20, and they all had fairly extensive uh, criminal histories. So seven or more prior court appearances for half of them, and 40% had four or more prior prison episodes. Interestingly, when we compared those who started with those who, uh, those who started and those who didn't start, as well as those who completed and those who didn't start, uh, there were very few difference, at least on the variables that we could observe. There was only three that I've listed there. Um, there was a higher proportion of starters and completers who were aged above 30. There was a smaller proportion of completers amongst the Aboriginal inmates and uh, there was a higher proportion of starters who had five or more prior proven violent offences. In terms of uh, re-offending rates, this is just uh, the unadjusted rate, so we haven't controlled for any other covariates and we haven't done anything fancy in terms of the IV methods. So all we have here is each of the four outcomes along the x-axis and we have the proportion in each of the groups who are um, observed on that outcome. So the greys did not start, the yellow is they did start VOTP. So the first thing you'll notice is that there is a, a fairly sizable difference here in terms of general reoffending, about 10 percentage point difference between the two groups. Uh, when we look, however, at uh, reoffending with a new violent offence, the difference is much smaller, only around about four percentage points there. If we look at the completers, it's a similar pattern. Uh, orange is the completers, grey is the did not start or complete. Um, I, sorry, I'll just go back. Again, we're seeing about a 10 percentage point difference in terms of general reoffending. And now we're seeing a much larger difference in terms of violent offending. It's now around about eight percentage points. As I said, this is just the unadjusted rates. We haven't done anything else. So uh, Sarah then went off and, and ran her linear probability model. Um, here we have the results for the VOTP starters. So what you really need to look at is each of the outcomes here on the left-hand side. This is the coefficient that's associated with the treatment status. That's our variable of interest in the model. The p-value, standard area associated with it estimate and the sample size. Just wanted to mention the sample size because you can see it varies depending on which outcome we're looking at. And this is because some people may re return to custody, as I said, before we're able to observe the outcome. So particularly in terms of the violent offending outcome, we're only looking at a sample size of about 400 inmates, so quite small, particularly if we're using more uh, sophisticated methods such as an IV analysis. But what this is telling you is that there's a negative coefficient for each of the four outcomes, which means that our uh, starters are less likely to re-offend in terms of general offending and violent offending. If we look at the p-values, though, we're only seeing at less than 0.05 for the general offending outcomes. In terms of the two-stage least squares results, this is the IV approach that we adopted in the analysis. Uh, what we've got again up the top there, we've got each of the four outcome measures, the coefficient associated with the treatment status, p-values, standard errors and ends. So again we're seeing negative coefficients, um, so that means that they're less likely to uh, be observed on each of those outcomes, less likely to general to have a, a, a new uh, re-offence whether or not it's violence or uh, any type of offence. 
but none of those uh, differences are statistically significant at the 0.05 level. Uh, and again, as I said, we're, we've got much larger standard errors, uh, which is a limitation of this two-stage least squares approach. What we've got down here, and that's in the bulletin as well, is what uh, Sarah's called an endogeneity test. This is trying to tell us whether a mid variable bias is a real problem for us, whether the estimates we're getting from the two-stage least squares models is significantly different from what we're getting with the uh, ordinary one-stage uh, regression. Uh, this is a p-value. They're all very high. So it's suggesting that uh, may, mid variable bias may not be as much of an issue for us. It gives us a little bit more confidence that what we're seeing from the ordinary least squares models is a genuine uh, effect, uh, though we can't be um, too, uh, we can't say that it is causal because it doesn't deal with unobserved uh, differences. In terms of the completers, I won't go through it all again, but basically we found the same thing. Completing VOTP was correlated with between six and nine percentage point reduction on average in risk. Um, but we're only seeing a, a statistically significant effect for general reoffending and general reoffending returning to custody. Uh, the two stage least squares results, again, um, negative coefficients uh, are there, but nothing is at the level which we would say was statistically significant and therefore um, an effect that we can be completely confident in. So, conclusions. Well, the results are promising, uh, at least in terms of general reoffending. Um, we can't rule out bias. Uh, we can't say they're definitely causal effects because we didn't find a significant effect from the uh, instrumental variable model that we estimated. Um, however, it, the, all of the coefficients were negative and in the right direction, which is promising. Uh, but really, this work needs to be replicated, uh, ideally with a randomised control trial, um, as David suggested in the last session. However, this is usually uh, not an option within custody, given that these are very risky offenders. We can conduct a longer follow-up. That's an excess solution, and, and we will be looking at doing that later on down the track. This will increase our sample size, uh, as well as give us longer time to observe these violent offending outcomes. The other issue that we uh, just flag in the bulletin, which I think is an important one, is uh, trying to unpack um, what it is about VOTP that is producing any effect, or um, if it is producing effect in terms of reoffending, and particularly this post-release maintenance program, how uh, essential that is to achieving any reductions in reoffending. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, this work has been released already and the report's available on our website. You can download it for free. But happy to take any other questions. Sarah is also happy to take any other questions after this session if um, people want to talk to her about the methods that she used there. Thanks, Karen. Suzanne, we've got time for some questions, so we've got a roving mic. If you've got a question for Suzanne, just put your hand up. Hi, thanks. That was um, that was really really interesting. I was just wondering, with the people who um, did reoffend after completing the program, are you able to sort of tease out if they reoffended for a more or less serious offence, or if it was sort of a similar level, like an assault to an assault or something? Uh, we do know what type of offence they committed. Um, it's very it's a crude measure, it's an offence type, it doesn't really tell you how serious that offence is. Um, it is. Look, in general, I would say that um, they, they're committing a whole bunch of different types of offences, and um, some of them may be more severe in the, in the first offence, but then they might be uh, committing something less severe in the next offence. So I guess the measure of severity for us in this analysis was a violent offence and that was uh, grievous bodily harm or actual bodily harm, so it didn't include a common assault. So it is a fairly serious offence, and a very large proportion of them were committing those offences. We were looking at and the unadjusted rates, I think, were up around 40%, even amongst those who were completers. Thank you. Um, I was also wondering um, about the definition of violence just wondering if domestic violence <coughs> is considered part of that. 
Yeah, it would be if it's an actual bodily harm or grievous bodily harm. Yeah. But you wouldn't be able to look at, like, you don't know. We do. Happened. We didn't look at it. Right. Um, and to tell you the truth, we didn't even um, look at what proportion of the sample were domestic violent offenders. We can do that. Uh, the measure that's used by corrective services isn't the measure that we use in our court data, which is the law part code, which is tied to the legislation. So it's very clear that it's a domestic violence offence. But they do have um, a flag for uh, whether or not uh, there's a history or a current offence for domestic violence. So it is possible that we could do that. Again, if we start cutting this sample size down even further, um, the chances of us picking anything up in terms of a, a significant effect is going to be reduced. So um, there's a lot of different combinations we'd like to look at in terms of offender characteristics, and uh, but you just won't be able to do it with the sample size that we have. I just had one other question, sorry. Um, in terms of the uh, success rates for the Aboriginal offenders, do you, uh, are you able to say the yeah the uh, success rate? So you had six to nine percent uh, for general offending. Are you able to break that down by Aboriginality? Sorry for the just whether or not they reoffended. Well, what was the success success rate for the um, Indigenous offenders that were that participated in the program? Oh, uh, we we could. I we haven't done that. Um, but yeah, we could look, there's about half of the sample were Aboriginal, um, so we can look at whether there's uh, any differences, at least in terms of unadjusted rates, in terms of reoffending. Um, but again, yeah, if we're going to be doing any sort of causal estimates, uh, we're unlikely to be able to pick up any significant effects. So certainly could do a descriptive analysis looking at that. Okay, all right, I think Suzanne will be around during yep. the break for the rest of the day, so we might leave it there for Suzanne's presentation. Um, can you join me again in thanking her?